What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Do note that I am the award winner in the innovation category last year from the Canadian Ethnic Media Association, innovation award winner. And this is the place of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations. And we have a friend. I think I believe I can call her a friend because she's she's been on enough. <laughs> yes, you can call me friend. <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, I cannot forget her little man, who is the 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 man of the house. I don't see him tonight, but that's okay. Yeah, he might pop in later. We'll see. Okay. He has a way of doing that, eh? He has a way of just popping his head in at the end. Well, we have Serena Wills back with us. Uh, I'll let her just give a little bit about her bio. Hey, and we have a friend, Dr. Tachi, is with us. Fellow hey. right there she is. And, oh, uh, Yes, and uh, so Ms. Serena is going to continue our conversation about Lyme disease tonight, but I'd like her to share a little bit of her background first. Go ahead. Well, thank you again for having me back. Um, it's always an honor and a pleasure to be on the Dr. Vibe show especially the award-winning show. I mean, you know. And my name is Serena Wills. I am a National Board Certified Health and Wellness Coach through the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaches. I am a published author of two poetry books, working on two more that are coming out, one this December, and my next book after that will come out next May, which will talk about my journey with Lyme disease. I am, yeah, I'm working on two books at the same time. <laughs> well, that's what you, that's what you sororers do. You go over and above, right? All out, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I am all out, you know, that's, that's what we got to do. I am a loving mother to a now eight year old. He turned eight last Monday. So I have an official eight year old an official second grader in the house. And I live in the Washington DC area. I am originally from Jamaica, Queens, New York, born and raised. And I received my Master of Arts degree just last year um, from Maryland University of Integrative Health in Health and Wellness Coaching. And I have a bachelor's from Syracuse University and another oh master's from Whew. Virginia Tech. So that's just oh. a little bit about me. I'm going to put a pause <laughs> there. And we will talk about uh, Lyme disease. We'll pick up where we left off and something near and dear and very personal to me since I was diagnosed with this horrid disease, December 2012. I can't believe it'll be seven years. Wow. This, uh, and actually next month was the month. It's always like that last week of September, I get a little depressed. That was the week where all the symptoms just started like coming out of nowhere. So Right. It was September 2012. I got bitten, and there went the journey. Just that was the start of the battle. <laughs> well, yeah. well, before we go any further, we did hail, hail. Uh, we where I come from, we hail up Dr. Tachi. So, as whenever Dr. Tachi comes <laughs> on any of these epic conversations, whether she's watching or she takes a, a spot, I just want to tell everybody: make sure if you're available on Wednesday evenings. Yes. At 5 p.m. via Instagram Live or 6 p.m. via Facebook Live and uh, Periscope. Why did I forget? Periscope. She hosts the Livis online stream about media, tech, and pop culture. And she has one of her regular contributors and supporters right there, Serena Wills. They are oh, yeah. like every every Wednesday. Like I think I think Tachi Tachi gives Serena love because Serena love. It's in my calendar. Like yeah, every, I know that. Looks like, what are you doing Wednesday evening? Like, I'm free after seven. <laughs> well, <laughs> seven, seven thirty, the latest. We can hang out after that. You no, know, you just can't interrupt and make sure the boys' dinner's made before six o'clock. So wow. I can just because wow. it is a lot. It's a live conversation, and we just have a great time on there. I just, I love it. And happy anniversary again to Mediascope. Yes. Celebrate four years. So looking forward to this Wednesday. Absolutely. Uh, before we get into our conversation, between our conversation, just a little recap, just if you could share with our audience, what is not Lyme disease? And actually you have a question, especially with Lyme disease and summertime. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, so let's is... talk about Lyme disease first, and we'll get into more flow of a conversation. Okay. Well, for those who uh, missed the last conversation or they're new to Lyme disease altogether, Lyme disease uh, was came around uh, latter 60s, 70s in the United States um, out of a town that was right on the outside or in Lyme, Connecticut. So that's, the, that's where the name came from, L-Y-M-E. So not the Lyme you put in drinks, it's Lyme with a Y. Um, I was bitten by a tick. So you get Lyme disease by being bitten by just a, a tick, um, a black-legged tick. And these ticks carry the bacteria, um, Borrelia, that can, you know, transmit into your bloodstream, into your body, which is the Lyme bacteria, Lyme disease. It also carries a host of other things. And this is, this tick can be microscopic. We're not talking a huge insect here. Um, it could be as small as a beauty mark on your arm. Mm. And it could leave a mark. Mine didn't really leave an obvious mark. It looked like a mosquito bite, but the more obvious marks look like bullseye rashes. But it could also uh, transmit viruses, uh, fungi, and co-infections. That's what we didn't get a chance to talk about last time. And Lyme disease has a host of co-infections that, I mean, Lyme disease is bad enough by itself. Then you have these co-infections that can make it 100 times worse. Okay. Um, and you, I mean, it's you know, children, adults, do, um, pets, animals, anyone can get bitten by a tick. Um, it is running rampant in the United States. We're at about 200 something thousand cases per year. Um, and that's just those who know they have Lyme disease. There are a lot of people who are undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Uh, I did some, some fact checking about Canada because that was a question before is, is Lyme in Canada, and the answer is yes, and it actually is on the rise in Canada, not to scare you, Dr. Vibe, um, but yeah, I looked up today, and it's still low on the low end. Um, Toronto in 2017 had close to 80 cases. Ontario had about 987, and in Canada as a whole, there are about 1,400 cases that they know of, because like I said, Lyme uh, a lot of people can be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed because it does mimic other diseases and chronic illnesses. So it is on the rise in Canada. So, you know, just folks be, be careful. It is summertime. So summer, you're out and about, your arms are out, your legs are out. You know, a lot of folks are doing the nature hikes and the nature walks and they're you know, brushing up against bushes and trees like I did that September 2012. And that's how I picked up a tick on my arm was uh, doing a nature walk with coworkers. Now the whole group of about 10, I was the only one bitten. So um, yeah, on my right arm. But yeah, I mean, anything, you know, with insect wise is on the rise when the weather is warmer. Um, in the cooler months, you know, later fall, winter, not as much naturally because it's cold outside, but you want to be careful if you have pets. Um, I have one friend who didn't know her dog had ticks and, you know, didn't have the flea and tick collar on him and the ticks uh, were transmitted to her um, because the dog likes to sleep in the bed and the ticks get in the bed and now she's sleeping in the bed and, and there you have it. And it wasn't even summer or fall. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure we are very... Very yeah. careful. Well, and and I you of course you've already covered my first conversation piece in regards to summertime and and Lyme disease. Uh, another and we'll, we'll get to the co-infection piece. Another thing I want to talk about with this conversation part two is because people are color are darker skinned. Yeah. Is it harder for diagnosis or even thinking about you may have Lyme disease with a darker skin? Um, like I said, it's hit or miss with the bullseye rash. Um, but darker skinned people, sometimes you don't even know you, you were bitten by a mosquito until, you know, you're, you're scratching your arm or leg. Um, and the same with a bullseye rash, especially, you know, dark skinned people would not see that rash necessarily because it's, it's a red circular rash. It looks like the target sign, the store target. Um, but a lot of people don't get that, that bullseye. 
you know, rash. And, you know, that's, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is like me, I was misdiagnosed about 10 times before I got the official diagnosis. So doctor after doctor was misdiagnosing me. And then luckily when I did get to the doctor who diagnosed me, we did blood work and she actually diagnosed me before the blood work came back. But my blood work came back highly positive. But there are what I call, what I mean, was actually out there is called false negatives. So you can have Lyme disease and your blood work can come back negative. And a doctor will write you off and say, oh, you don't have Lyme because your blood work was negative. Well, the bacteria can hide anywhere in your body, your tissue, the tissue, the muscles, um, it can hide in your brain. So it doesn't have to necessarily be in your bloodstream. So that's the other trick to Lyme disease. This is a very smart bacteria, <laughs> so. Okay, you, you mentioned something that you didn't before, and I'd like to get an next. What's the bull's eye rash? That is the, um, when you get when you get bitten by the, a tick, it leaves, like how you get bitten by a mosquito bite, you get a little red bump on your arm. Um, a bee sting, they have like their own signature, you know, bump unless you have an allergy to bee stings. Ticks leave this bullseye rash. So the bite is a red mark in the middle, but then it leaves this big circle oh. outside of that bite. And it literally looks like the red target sign at the store. That It looks like that on your body. And, um, you know, people with lighter skin, it'll, it'll come right up one, two, three. But that's, um, and it's not, you know, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. I didn't get the bullseye rash, but a lot of people do. Okay. You mentioned you want to talk about the co-infections. Yes. Yeah. Those are very, Lyme disease is ugly in itself, but then we have these lovely co-infections that like to come along with it. So um, I uh, got, you know, tested for Lyme disease, came back positive. I also, you know, contracted a couple of viruses from Lyme disease, but then I also battled two co-infections. So one went away. Uh, it's called Bartonella. It's also known as um, a lot of people have cats. They say you can get it from a cat or fleas. But Lyme, you know, uh, ticks can actually transmit Bartonella to you as well. And it has its own host of symptoms. So my symptoms were I was very feverish. I had this very sharp pain in the bottom uh, soles of my feet. So you can imagine oh. you're trying to walk around and your feet feel like they're on fire. Um, then it also, a couple of the co-infections have similar symptoms. So it can also cause anxiety. Um, and the other, uh, co-infection I had is called Babesia and Babesia mimics malaria. So oh. people think, some people think they have malaria and they actually have Babesia because they both are, they're, they're almost, they're almost mirror image to each other. And sometimes you can treat Babesia with malaria-like medications. Uh, Babesia is one of the hardest co-infections for some reason to get rid of because it is a parasite. So you now have these parasites in you and they're in your body and it causes, like I said, anxiety. Um, a classic symptom of Babesia is called air hunger. So shortness of breath. You just can be, you know, just be on your couch doing nothing and all of a sudden you feel like you're having an asthma attack. Um, the other thing is disequilibrium, poor gait, and that's spelled G-A-I-T. So you feel like you're always dizzy or you have a form of vertigo. And oh. I have that as well. And I still battle with that symptom. I still have mm. vertigo-like symptoms even today. <laughs> today was so, there's, so, so there's a relationship between vertigo, a potential relationship between vertigo and Lyme disease? Yeah. A lot of people get the dizziness wow. and because it can impact your ears. So, I mean, the bacteria could go anywhere. So it can really uh, throw off the, the fluid level in your ears, especially if your body's highly inflamed. But with Lyme, but especially particularly Babesia, it does cause disequilibrium and vertigo. I remember at my old job, it was a huge, huge building. I think I was telling you, it's like four city blocks long. And when you're in a huge space, I would just get dizzy. And I felt like I didn't know, you know, where I was going. I felt like I was going to fall. So I had to literally scale the walls 
Like I, I walked very, very closely to the walls of the building mm-hmm. just to get around um, until I got the proper accommodations um, to, you know, have assistance. Or we had an underground parking lot. I would get in my car and drive across the parking lot to get to the other side of the building just to cut out the four block walk and go up the elevators and then continue my walk to drop off paperwork, for example. Wow. But yeah, wow. it is really, um, you know, there, there are other co-infections depending on what part of the country or what part of the, part of the world you're in, but those are the two that I, I battled with personally. One, like I said, thank goodness is gone, but the one that I'm, I'm starting to treat for again now, I started treating for it a while ago, but they said, let's keep treating for the Lyme disease and come back to Babesia. So we're going to start treating to try to get these last several symptoms out my system. We think this all, you know, correlated with Babesia. So Dr. Tachi is adding here sound that sounds like when she used to work at the World Bank, how big you heard that place was that you worked at. Yes. And so let me understand correctly here. You're dealing with Lyme disease plus a co-infection at the same time? Yeah, I had the Lyme disease, I had two co-infections, and I also got viruses with it. It can also mimic um, ESV, um, H, HSV, which is the herpes simplex virus. Oh, come so on. Oh, yeah. it, it can really it can really turn your body upside down. Because I was always, I tested negative for all of this. I was a completely healthy person physically, um, you know, running marathons and African dancing and traveling the world. But it, it can also, you know, give you viruses and fungi, you know, and it could also increase uh, your yeast produ- production. So there's a thing called candida, which I battled with too. And it's an increase of yeast and too much yeast in your body is not good. So that's where the dietary restrictions came in. That's where the detoxification of my body came in because you can treat and treat until the cows come home. But if you're not detoxing your body, if you're not eating correctly, um, if you're not de-stressing, I had a lot of stress on me, um, you will never get well. So are, are you fighting both of these at the same time or do you have to fight because the way you mentioned it it sounds like you have to work on one and then work on the other am i incorrect in that yeah it it depends on the person in my case we worked on the lyme disease first because it carried the most symptoms and we not just the lyme but we just worked on my overall physical and mental and spiritual emotional health at the same time because Going back to the last show, you know, as I was telling people, I went through a lot of loss before I was bitten by the tick. You know, I lost my sister in 2007. I lost my mom in 2010. You know, I was blessed to give birth to my son in 2011, you know, became a single mom because I was rejected. So here I am battling heartbreak and I had a very stressful job that did not appreciate me. So when I got bitten by this tick, it just manifested in ways unimaginable. So we tackled Lyme disease first. I have a cadre of doctors. So I have an herbalist that I work with and a naturopathic doctor that I I work with. And those are the two right now, you know, just taking their advice and just protocols. I'm going to start working and tackling this co-infection that has just been kind of hanging on for years. It just won't go away. Mm. A lot better. Like I tell people, by looking at me, you wouldn't think, you know, I'm still battling something. But I tell people, it's with anyone with any illness. You could look completely fine on the outside and be crumbling on the inside. I'm not crumbling, but I'm not back to my 110% self either. So, right. Well, just want to shout out some people who are watching uh, on Periscope. We've got you foresight and Herbie's hang hang out. And uh, Herbie's Hangout, thank you so much for retweeting it to all your Twitter and Pyroscope followers. And on the Get Local platform, we have Big Bad Brad and also Elena. Again, as always, if you're on the Get Vocal platform, more than happy to come and take a seat, ask some questions, add some, add the positive value you always do during our epic conversations. And I'm monitoring also YouTube. So if any comments are there, we'll make sure that they get 
into the flow. Okay. I, I, I'm going to ask this now, and maybe it's better to ask later, but I do want to ask this now. Hereditary. No. You have a you have a wonderful eight year old son. Yes. Yeah. How much are you concerned, or is, should there be a concern, especially of the Lyme disease, hereditary? Maybe his chances being increased of him getting it. Well, luckily, um, and I tell people it depends on your body makeup. You can have the best genes in the world, and like I said, in my case, I was mentally and emotionally spiritually crumbling from everything I went through. And luckily I, and you know, it's just divine order. I had my son 13 months before I got bitten. So I did not pass on the disease to him because that is also a fear of some women um, who have Lyme disease or healing from Lyme disease. Am I going to pass it on to my baby, you know, in vitro? So, cause that can happen, but there's no, there's, I'm sure there are studies out there about hereditary, but it really is just basically, you know, if he gets bitten by a tick, a lot of people get bitten by ticks and don't even contract Lyme disease at all. They don't even get the disease. So it just depends on, you know, which tick bites you and just, you know, your, your makeup, you know, but I think he's, he's, he's a lot healthier than I was at eight. I tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when he gets sick it's like oh my gosh like i i was that child i was a i don't want to say sickly child but every month i had either a sore throat a strep throat or something going on in the winter or the flu or and he be, i mean thank god i mean i'm just thankful he barely gets ill so i can already tell his genes are he's a lot stronger than i was at eight <laughs> He's also very athletic. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. And then he has a father and that side of the family. So, but yeah, it all is just, you know, case by case. So I, I tell people, you know, and it's, it is sad to see children get Lyme disease because, you know, they're children. So there are children out there that are going to school and they're being treated for Lyme disease while still trying to go to elementary school, for example, or junior high and high school. Right. Um, just a comment here from you, Farsight, on Periscope. He says, and that is why illness has dragged on so long. We think just because we look good that we feel good, and that's not always the case. You got it. Yep, because you don't know what that person is going through internally. Absolutely. Yeah. Just want to also shout shout out Alex from the Get, Get Vocal team. Thank you for jumping in. And uh, Alex is just sharing that this is also live being live stream on Facebook and him and the Get Vocal team have uh, streamlined the process to have Get Vocal broadcasts put on a number cool. of different platforms. So thank you so much for yeah, making it, uh, it simplified the process. So please, if you're yes. wanting to do some live streaming, this is a great platform to do it and you can broadcast it on a number of different platforms at the same time. So there's the Get Vocal plug. There we got it. We got it going on. So thank you so much. That is great. And let's move on. How how has the since you like I don't want to say this word, but has it contracted Lyme disease mm -hmm. to now? How has the awareness and how has the dealing with it from the medical profession to patients changed, stayed the same? or gotten worse? I will say I, here in the United States, I know we have some folks here internationally like yourself, but state by state, there are more states that are more aware. Um, I know New York State, for example, um, passed a bill about a year, it's very recent, a year or two ago. Um, they're, they're making it so Lyme disease treatment is, is not looked at as something foreign. It is, you know, they want people to be aware. They want insurance companies to pick up the tab more on treatments. Um, you know, so it's really, a, you know, a great thing. I know in Virginia, uh, I know the governor had a very, um, you know, actually family um, had Lyme disease. So they were looking at writing some bills to not just make it aware, but so people can be treated 
for Lyme disease, because like I was, I told people I was coming out of my pocket thousands of dollars a year, you know, to the point where I took a loan out on my paid off SUV just to pay for medical treatment. So (laughs) I know California is another big state. Um, They're the ones that kind of have led, um, you know, the trailblazers. And I mean, they have a lot of integrative health professionals on the West Coast and California and Oregon and Washington State that treat for Lyme disease. Arizona is another big place. So it is becoming more, um, people are starting to know what it is more. There's more awareness. Uh, there's, still, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, um, especially since the disease is very tricky. Um, and like I said, it mimics so many other diseases and there, there are these false negatives. So I'm glad that insurance companies are starting to pick up the tab on these specialty labs. We were talking about that before too, that really do a deep dive into your blood work and they do blood smears and they look at the really look at your blood to see if you have just Lyme, if you have the co-infections and you know the levels that are in your blood versus just a general blood test. Because those tests can be hundreds of dollars easily. Some could be seven, eight hundred dollars. But some insurance companies, I remember once I did a blood test, it should have cost close to five hundred dollars. And I paid, you know, the money and then I got a reimbursement check for about 400. So my insurance covered 400. So Serena, is that the norm that you hear? People are getting reimbursed or are are the majority of people you speak with basically funding medication and treatment out of their own pocket and not getting reimbursed? Well, yeah, it depends on your insurance company. Um, I had Care First at the time, which is a pretty good insurance company. There are still some that are very stubborn and they're not trying to pay for anything. I know all of my IV treatments were never covered under my insurance plan. Uh, There are still, you know, people that are coming out of their pocket, thousands of dollars. There are these beautiful integrative health medical centers. Um, There's one in Arizona, the Invita Center, and it's beautiful, but if you don't have the money to go there, um, people are taking out, people are taking out loans as if they're getting getting houses just to get treated for Lyme disease still. So it's still, that's still the battle that we're having is getting everything covered. You might not get everything covered, but people shouldn't be going broke to get better and get well. Because a lot of the treatments like mine, I didn't do just medications. A lot of my treatments were IVs with vitamin IV infusions and food grade peroxide I'm on a customly compounded medication that I have to get done, um, made every month from a certain uh, apothecary down in Florida. And they have one up here in, Mar- in Maryland, but the one in Florida was cheaper. <laughs> and, and that, you know, insurance, my insurance company used to cover $5 of that medication, $5. And then they said, nope, we're not going to cover anymore. So I, I pay that out of pocket. Um, so there are some things a lot of things that we still cover, you know, like when I go see my herbalist or, you know, naturopathic doctor, my insurance company won't cover that. Um, you know, so there's still those, those integrative health uh, providers that are not covered. Um, and then when I do things like detoxification, like colon hydrotherapy or infrared sauna treatment or ionic foot baths, that's coming out of my pocket insurance Some insurance companies are starting to cover those, but my, you know, a couple are not. But there are insurance companies covering even things down to acupuncture and massage therapy now. So it all depends on your individual insurance plan and the company you're with. Absolutely. I just want to catch up with some comments here. You Foresight is commenting on Periscope and YouTube. So let me get, and he goes, (laughs) he's he's, uh, double dipping here. Are you, you, you almost think the doctor should have an expose when they give out free screening more often, but go to communities that need it, the most free screenings would help a lot. So basically saying free screening should happen to the communities that need it the most. Yeah, that would be, yeah, it would be great to just say, you know what, I think I'm, I have Lyme disease. I would like to get a free blood test and they just pick up the tab, like one, two, three, you know, and, you know, and treat it as if, you know, you see now, HIV age, you can go and get your, you know, free screening. I know Lyme disease, you have to like send off, you know, the blood work like anything else. 
but you know, I think more people may be aware, and especially, you know, with these specialty labs, that's where it gets tricky because you have, like here in the United States, we have Quest Diagnostics and LabCorp. Those are the big guns in regards to labs, but the specialty labs, that's another hurdle that we have to jump over because like I said, insurance companies, some won't even cover a dime and they're the ones that are the most thorough when it comes to this blood work. So if you go to so, a specialty so lab- the more, most thorough give the least reimbursement. Yep, you got oh, it. Okay. Yep, yep, you got it. <laughs> That's the best way to say it, yep. yep. Capital, capitalism at its finest. Capitalism healthcare at its finest, right? My friend was diagnosed negative through LabCorp, nothing against LabCorp, but they did the general test, you know, the Western blot and the Lyme titers and everything else. And then she went to a specialty lab, cost her several hundred dollars called Igenix. And she came yeah. back highly positive, highly positive for not just Lyme disease, but she had co-infections and viruses as well. So when one lab didn't pick up, the other lab picked it up and she knew where to get started. Okay, all right. Dr. Dr. Tachi is hailing in saying $5. What an insult. And then she goes, what, geez, what the hell are we paying insurance for? You got it. Yeah, exactly. And then, so just, go ahead. Yeah. No, I write that medication off on my taxes. So my taxes, I think you could write up to, you have to have like at least, I think, 2000 You could write up to $2,000 off, which is also a gimmick because easily one year I had almost $6,000 in medical costs that I paid out of pocket. And then the IRS just kind of cuts you off <laughs> at a certain, you know, like, okay, you can only write off this amount and the rest, I guess, just falls to the wayside. But yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and I just want to update here. We got now people watching on Periscope, Facebook, Get Vocal, YouTube. So it's all over the place. People come. Thanks for the support and the love. Please feel free to make comments. With, with, you, I look at yourself. You are more highly knowing of the state of the union when it comes to Lyme disease. My concern is the average person doesn't have this knowledge. No, they don't. And I, I, I'll give like a lot of props to my integrative health doctor, Dr. M, I will call her that. Um, she's based out of DC. She's the one that kicked off. She had booked on Lyme disease on her bookshelf in her office. She didn't say, oh, go to this website, go here. She grabbed the book off the shelf and said, here's a book, here's a booklet. I want you to start learning about what you, you know, the disease you have. And she said, but we're also going to learn about how you can heal internally and she was the one that really kicked off me just doing a lot of in-depth research and as well as as the herbalists and the naturopathic doctors i went to i just made sure i asked every question i could i knew which organizations to do research through because you can't trust everything you see online so there are some very highly reputable organizations i went to and, you know, just in the know with other Lyme disease groups, there's a conference every year and just try to stay in the know. But like you said, it's not something average. The average person is not going to just know what Lyme disease is. And that's why I make it my mission, like I do with GYN and ovarian cancer, to make people aware, you know, because there's not enough. The average person should know about this. Right. Okay. All right. Makes sense how do you feel, do you feel the medical profession is more proactive now in regards to treating Lyme disease? It depends on the doctor. There are still doctors writing it off as something else, um, misdiagnosing patients for something else. Um, and there are some in the medical field that are very proactive, like my doctor. I wasn't even the blood work wasn't even drawn yet. And she says, I think your symptoms are, they're mimicking Lyme disease. Cause she said, you have been diagnosed, misdiagnosed. She said with MS, lupus, ALS, <laughs> asthma, pneumonia, the list goes on. And she said, you don't have any of these. I really think you have Lyme because it can look like all of those and then some. And then she said, let's do the blood work. Then we did the blood work. 
you know, but she was one, she is, I won't say she's rare, but doctors like that are a gem, you know, and I'm thankful that she has a lot of younger people in her practice because she wants to pass the torch eventually and educate them. But there are a lot of doctors, I believe they are educating themselves more on Lyme disease, but there's still too many that are not, and they're not taking Lyme disease seriously at all. So let's let's get a, a, some great thought process from here. If you feel that you have Lyme disease, if you're speaking to anyone in our audience here live or on the replay, you go to your doctor, what should you be telling your doctor and what should he be looking for? He or well, she, thing, he or she be looking he, for. Well, the one thing I tell people is I have journals of, I have lists of symptoms. So when these symptoms sort of snowballing, I wrote a list out, you know, I said, okay, let me just write these symptoms down because A, they're just unusual. And they're, it was just, they just were slamming me, just coming out of left field. So when I went to each doctor, I had my list of symptoms and we're talking pages of symptoms here, not like five or 10 symptoms, but at one point I had like 34, 35 plus symptoms. And the doctor that would only have me in and out for 10 minutes, I never went back to them. I'm like, you know, it takes you more than 10 minutes to read my, my pages of symptoms and to right. talk to me. Right. So that's the thing I tell people is you want to, you know, A, I always tell people, look at their ratings. Thank God there are ratings now. Um, to go on there, see if they know what Lyme disease is, call in advance, see if they treat, you know, yes, you can treat for chronic illnesses such as, you know, cancer and AIDS and things of that nature, but do they treat for, you know, Lyme disease? Do they treat um, MS patients? Do they treat lupus? Do they treat, you know, those, those kinds of diseases? But you really want, when you sit down with that doctor, you will know. I mean, it's just between the body language um, if they're really taking you seriously, are they taking notes as you're talking? Um, you know, are they going to say like my one doctor, it took her a couple of weeks before she realized, I think Serena has Lyme, but she really took a lot of notes. Every time we spoke, this woman took pages of notes, would then go back to her notes and research what we said in the conversation and look at past patients. So she looked at other patients that has similar symptoms to me. And that's when it dawned on her, I really think Serena has Lyme disease, but you want to make sure you have your, your list of symptoms. You want to have your medical history. You know, like I went in there and told them I was training for my sixth marathon. And now all of a sudden I can't walk on my left leg. What is going oh. on with my body? Oh. You know, my left leg was going weak. You know, I was having dizzy spells. I was, I couldn't breathe. You know, I had muscle twitches and spasms and you know, chest pains and, and pains in my rib cage. And doctor after doctor, it took it took several weeks to get to doctor. But it really, um, you know, I'm glad that I, I finally got to her through a referral. I think I told you last time it was a referral through Groupon. My friend found her on Groupon. Yes. And Serena, I have this great integrative health doctor. I think you should see her. And that's another key thing. If, if you can get a referral, from friends who have great doctors, I would go with them because they already know that doctor. And if they're coming highly referred, then then go for it. Okay. But sometimes you don't like, I didn't know really what Lyme disease was. I had heard about it, but I didn't know what it was. Mm. It's, it's interesting. And you mentioned something interesting too, that you did a lot of, uh, then, you mentioned also something that I'm sure a lot of people don't do is document. You journaled what was going on. Yes. Yep. What, what made you start doing that? Well, I'm already a writer. So, you know, that, that, that was just key. And I had, I just have journals laying around my house just because people give me journals every year for my birthday. You should see the stack of blank journals. I still have yet to write in. But something told me this is going to be, this is not a flu. This is not pneumonia. This is, this is different. Take mm -hmm. notes. And that's when I started jotting down like week by week, how am I feeling? And when I started seeing that I was progressively getting worse to the point where I'd take a month off of work, Ooh. unpaid, 
because I was still on probation because it was a newer job and my job was very, um, a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy. God forbid they would say, oh, you know what? She just started this job, give her a break. She's very ill, she's a single mom, let's pay her. You know, I was accruing leave while I was at the job but they wouldn't let me use it because I was on probation. But, um, but yeah, and especially when I was home for that month, I really had a lot of time to just take down notes and every doctor I went to, um, I would just take my, my journal. And especially when I went to, you know, Dr. M, um, she was so thankful that I, I kept notes. You know, I told her, well, I'm, I'm naturally a writer. I was like, but something told me I have to document all of this because I may end up at that doctor's office that's not going to listen to me and I have to pull out my pages of notes <laughs> and show them I'm not going crazy because one doctor thought, oh, you know, you're just suffering from stress and anxiety. We're going to give you some benzodiazepines and you'll feel better. I'm like, no, I'm not suffering from anxiety. There's something physically wrong with me. You know, it, it's very interesting you mention this because I, I'm, I have a client right now who has been going through some health challenges for years. And um, she's, uh, she's saying she's in pain, she's in pain. And I went to, with her to her doctor recently. And the doctor says the MRI is showing nothing. Yep. Yeah. I have a friend in the same boat. I mean, MRIs, blood work, the whole shebang and everything yeah. is coming back clear. Yeah. And they think it's, you're crazy. Oh, it's in your mind. You're stressed. Take a vacation. Go take a week off of work. And yeah, it was, yeah, I was stressed, but now I'm more stressed because I'm, I'm physically ill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Dr. Tachi is always dropping great knowledge bombs as usual. She's saying that doctors have the tendency not to believe black women when it comes to pain. Yes. Yes. And, you know, no knock on doctors of other races or colors, but my integrative health doctor is, she, she's a mix. Uh, it's funny when people ask her, you know, what, what are you? And she says, I'm, I am the world. She was like, my, my dad is from, <laughs> I <laughs> my dad am is the from world. Kenya. Yeah. I think her dad's from Kenya and her mom is from France. And wow. I, the, the love story there is something in itself, but um, but she, yeah, she's a woman of color and she said, I want everyone to come through my doors and feel like they're listened to because there's That's just important. not enough doctors who are listening. There's, they're not, there's, there's not enough patient centered care around. You're not the center is that you, the doctor is, and you're on the outskirts just listening to what they have to say. Interesting. I know you're a very communal person. Do you have you heard any stories of people who have uh, who have Lyme disease and it's not been a positive experience? Yes, uh, there was a story I shared before. Um, I'll say it again: the woman who was misdiagnosed for ten years. Um, they thought she had multiple sclerosis because, like me, um, she has lesions in her brain because Lyme disease cause, oh. can cause lesions and inflammation in your brain but her lesions were in the pattern of multiple sclerosis. So the doctor just, boom, diagnosed her with MS. Had her on all the classic MS drugs. And this is now back latter, this is probably like early 2000s. So a lot of steroids, a lot of medications, and she said she was getting worse. And then she ended up being wheelchair bound. She couldn't walk. And then she said, I think it was her 10th or 11th year, you know, she went for her checkup and she got her annual, you know, MRI of her brain and spine and all the lesions were gone. The lesions are gone. The inflammation of the brain is, it, it, there was no more inflammation. Her brain wow. was a normal scan, normal. The spinal cord, everything was normal and she went to a whole other doctor, which is great. I tell people, if you don't like what one doctor says, go to another doctor. I went to several. Well, okay. So, Serena, I agree with you there. But you know it's, well, at least in Canada, what I've experienced, it's more and more difficult to get a doctor. Yeah. Well, that too. So, she just kept trooping on and she kept, she went to one doctor. By the third doctor, they said, well, clearly you don't have multiple sclerosis. <laughs> we know that. But there is something going on with you because you are still 
physically ill and that doctor knew about Lyme disease. Instantly tested her and she came back highly positive. They started treating her that year and she said within a year or two, she was 100% symptom free. Nice. After 10 years of being treated for MS. But <laughs> yeah, it is in certain instances, it is hard to go from doctor to doctor. You know, here in the United States, if you have Medicaid, for example, it's not easy to just see a specialist. You have to see what specialist will accept Medicaid since it's, you know, for lower income people. And, you know, and even myself and my son, when I was unemployed um, or just on, a, you know, part-time income, I had Medicaid. And some of my specialists, not, they don't pick up Medicaid. So I couldn't get an MRI of my brain without proving to Medicaid, you know, I have lesions in my brain. I would like to see if they're okay, if they're going away. So you're having to prove yourself all over again. Oh. And it's, it's just, they just make it 10 times harder. Didn't get a chance to ask you this the first time we had a conversation with this, but I think it's apropos I ask you now, what keeps you going? My son. Um, he is, I, I don't, I tell people, honestly, I, after having so much loss, I mean, my sister and my mom, that just rocked my universe. I lost them two and a half years apart. And even my grandmother, you know, when I told her I was pregnant with my son, she just bawled. And mm -hmm. she said, you can be renewed lease on life to stay around to see my great grandchild be born. And she's 95 now. She's still rocking and rolling. <laughs> um, but when you have a child or, you know, someone in your life that either you're caring for or you, you just want to be there, you know, I want to, I want to grow old. I want to see my son grow old. I want to see my grandchildren, but I mean, seeing him, I mean, he was only 13 months old when I was bit and I'm a single mother. You know, me and his dad live in different states at that. And that's where I really had to lean on my circle. You know, I have I have a tighter circle now. Let's put it like that. Lyme disease shows the good, bad, and ugly in friends and family. So I have a tighter circle because of it. But every IV treatment, every brain uh, scan, MRI, spinal tap, you name it, I've had it done. I just know that, you know, I'm trying to prolong my life and beat this thing so I can have a long life, God willing, for my Wonderful. son. Wonderful. So Wonderful. I haven't, you know, haven't fulfilled all of God's purpose here on this earth. So I really, it was some hard days, you know, laying flat on my face, crying, like bawling in this apartment and just thinking, I mean, there were times where the heart palpitations were so much. Um, the doctors were fearful, like, you know, your heart rate was pretty high, you know, because I sometimes had heart monitors on, on, you know, wow. just to monitor my heart. And I had, you know, cardiologists, you know, looking at my heart because, you know, Lyme disease can kill you. You know, it, it can, it can take you out of here. But, you know, shout out to my son. He was my, he still is my pride and joy and gives me that strength to get up every morning and keep doing it. How your his loving mother, how, where did he get this warrior strength inside of him? Well, he gets it from me. <laughs> I get it from my mom. I mean, my mom, she fought cancer until she couldn't fight it anymore. She was 60 when she died. I mean, she was so young. And I saw my mom go through a lot. She was a single mom. You know, I'm her only biological child. She adopted two two children, you know, one, one of my sisters is still alive that had a lot of medical complications um, because she just could not see them live in institutions and hospitals for the rest of their life. And she has this spirit like no other. My grandmother has been through so much loss. I mean, she lost all her siblings. She's one of six. So she's the last one standing out of all her five siblings out of my grandfather and his five siblings, all the in-laws have passed on. Mm. She is the mm. matriarch of the family. 
and she promised my grandfather 18 years ago when he died, I will not go anywhere anytime soon. She really kept that promise because she's yeah. 95 years old. So I come from a long line of warrior women. Um, it's just, um, you know, we just, we just fight and just, just our people in general, we have fought for so much. So, you know, my son, he sees me have my bad days and he's very, very empathetic, very sensitive. Um, now he's getting older, so he can make mom breakfast sometimes, which is nice. <laughs> nice. But I think my strength and the strength of my mom and grandmother is, is definitely going to roll over into him. Excellent. That's for sure. um, what has this journey, what are, I, I, I'm sure it's not just one thing, but what are one or two things been exposed to you that you did not know about yourself going through this journey? I thought I was, I always knew I was strong but I didn't know how strong I really was. This, I mean, I tell people when you go through the amount of death I have, have went through in such a short time frame, that will just put anyone in a mental institution in itself. But then when you yourself become physically ill to the point where you think you're checking out of here, and like I tell people, this is real talk. I had arrangements if something happened to me, his godmother knows where all the paperwork is. She knew to come and scoop him up. And between her and a couple of other best friends, they were going to raise my son. Wow. You know, we had that kind of conversation because it was that real. But, you know, I look back several years ago and I, it sounds strange, but I thank God for the journey because I have really learned to prune people out of my life that didn't belong. Um, God did some pruning, you know, as well, but there were just some people and places and things that did not belong in my presence that I didn't know before this journey. And also just health wise, I thought I was healthy because I'm running marathons and African dancing. And I thought I was eating well and I, I was eating pretty well, but now I have a bunch of dietary restrictions. And because of them, I feel so much, I feel so much better. You know, I'm gluten-free, I'm dairy-free. I haven't, had a sip of alcohol in almost seven years. I don't miss it at all, even though I loved wine. Um, <laughs> that was my thing. But you know, you you learn to, you have this whole new lifestyle now and just to not even take in so much stress. I, I, I just let things go. I can't let people stress me out. I will end a conversation in a heartbeat if it's going the wrong direction and say, you know what? let's talk about this another time when you calm down or we can both calm down. Cause I, I'm not going to raise my cortisol levels or blood uh, <laughs> pressure over you. So um, let's just end this. And I've learned to do that. I've learned to right. take steps back and just not even entertain certain people and things anymore. So learned a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. And you continue to learn. Yes, it's a continuous, as my grandmother says at 95, she's still learning and she's 95 years old. She said, you will you learn go. until the day you close your eyes and you're called home. Well, I think we are going to start winding it down here tonight. As always, I'd like to say thank you for taking time out of your positive, productive schedule with oh, us, as yes. always, sharing. Any final words you'd like to share with our audience? Well, I just want to thank everyone for chiming in. Um, like I said, this is something very near and dear to me. I will stay, I will advocate and always talk about Lyme disease until I can't talk anymore. And I'm a writer. I'll just write about it until I can't write anymore. Um, but, you know, if anyone has questions um, about, you know, what Lyme disease is, if you want to take the conversation offline, if you think a loved one has Lyme or is having problems with the disease because it is a very tricky disease they could reach out to me um on my you know i have two websites and i have an email my email is serena wills at yahoo.com and i have two websites uh, serena wills.com is my writer and publisher side of me and then i have divine right d-i-v-i-n-e-w-r-y-t-e.com and that is my health and wellness coaching practice website where i take on clients and helping them get better. 
as well. One, one final conversation piece. Has the thought, since you are a writer, has yeah. the thought ever come to your heart to write about this journey? Well, yeah, I mentioned it earlier that the book oh. in May of next year oh, sorry. is going to be my memoir okay. on Lyme disease. It is taking okay. a long time to write this book because it's very emotional. You know, sure. I can't just say I'm going to write for four or five hours today on this topic. It, it just takes, because you're revisiting where you were. And what you've been through. Ago, and it takes a lot, but I have a... I have a book signing on the calendar next May, so I have a deadline. So I. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so uh, I have, you know, I'm now. I've done a couple of workshops through the Alexander. Yes, Department you have. Libraries. Yes. And they, I have one book coming out in December, so that's called Awakening, Pieces of Life Volume Two. So it's a pickup from Pieces of Life Volume One. So that's December, and then they said we want to book you for next May. So that gave me more inspiration to get this book done because my story is going to help heal someone. I received that big time. On that note, we're going to close it down. Uh, this is another Epic Conversations. Dr. Vibe, your host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show, home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations. I want to thank some people who helped make this a lot, a lot via the live and epic conversation. You foresight for you too. Thank you very much. Uh, Herbie's hand, Herbie's hangout. I keep on saying, I'm always mistaking Herbie Hancock, <laughs> not Herbie, <laughs> so Herbie's me. hangout. But I'm speaking it one day, we'll have Herbie Hancock on hey, the Dr. Vibe Show. That would, that would be massive. That'd be very massive. <laughs> I also want to shout out to Alex and the Get Vocal team. Of course, Big Bad Brad, Elena, who stopped by, and Dr. Tachi, who was here from the get-go. Hey, Thank you Dr. so much. Yes. I think Elena, the one that stopped by, that's my Elena. I want to thank her because we go back to junior high and high school. So she knew what? Me. I think that's my friend Elena. We've known each other since the 80s. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. I want to that so thank, thank you all for being here. It's, it's a pleasure and it's a blessing to be able to have a platform to advocate and just spread awareness about Lyme disease. Well, that's what we're here for. That's what I'm here for. Uh, uh, the biggest leaders are the biggest servers. So I just try to serve, serve, serve. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's all we do. As always, I like to say, if you want to catch more of these conversations, either live or on the replay, audio, video wise, Go to my website, the D R V I V E S H O W dot com. We like to close out as always. Remember, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions and aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. God bless. Peace to all. Keep the faith and walk good, and we'll catch you Take soon. Care. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care.